Hello, Hoovians, and welcome back to the third channel. Da -da -da -da. And welcome back to Crazy Tom. The Tom that will stop freezing very soon because the computer will like me again. The connection between me and the computer are very vicious. Um, in a good way. Uh, so we're back today with more interviews, but in a special way. We've got a brand new podcast. Oh, shock horror. Yes, this will be podcast number 13. Shock horror indeed, I know. But this is a very special podcast. A podcast that, why has no one done this before? I have no idea. It's called the Niche TV Podcast, where each episode I'll be talking to a famous person or someone that has worked on an adaptation or a version of said program. Because there's a lot of niche TV out there that needs to be talked about. For instance, we have the Quater Mass Experiment in a very good example. Uh, but other than that, I'll remain the rest aloof. But we'll crack on. Our first guest and our, my first interview for this podcast is a very special guest. In the world of the TV show that we're talking about, he is best known as Dick Curran. But outside of... It, I pronounce that correctly, but I'll find out later. But outside of that, he's worked on Doctor Who. It's one and only Gary Russell. Borodar from Wales. Uh, that, hello, by the way. I should think it probably means good morning. I think, I think it means bore. From my toy, I think it means bore. I, th I think we'll, I think we'll have that. Um, and so we'll, we'll start at the very beginning because it's always a good place to begin. Uh, how did you get the role as uh, Dick in the Famous Five? Well, um, I'd been acting um, professionally for three years by that point, I think. Um, so I'd done some theatre stuff, done tours around the UK. Um, I'd done a TV series for the BBC called The Phoenix and the Carpet, uh, which I played one of the four leads in that. And while I was, while that was going out on TV, I was auditioning for Famous Five. And we went through an awful lot of auditions. I think there were six or seven in total. Um, and quite early on, I realized, I think that I was in the running quite heavily for this because they started mixing and matching me with other people. Um, so I met Marcus, who played Julian quite early on. And then we were sort of being, the two of us were being paired up against a series of girls uh, to eventually find uh, Anne and George. However, for all I know, they'd already picked Anne and George and they were testing them against us to see if we were any good. Who knows? Um, but that's how it happened. It was a long, long audition process. And then suddenly one day, right, you're going down to uh, the New Forest for the summer uh, to play Dick. And had you uh, actually read the books? Or you had been in Japan, I'd say it was five growing up. As a kid, I read them when I was about, well, I suppose I must have been about eight, seven or eight, maybe when I started reading them. Um, and ironically, my favourite character was Dick. So when at my uh, my one hour a week drama class, uh, I was told that I was going up for the audition for this. I was very excited because I immediately said, well, I want to play Dick because um, I liked him as a character because he was dry and funny and wasn't as pompous, I suppose, as Julian because he wasn't the leader. He didn't have to sort of be heroic and, and brave all dick really wanted to do was was sort of eat a lot drink a lot um and have a laugh but at the same time he was the one that usually got into trouble for being slightly cocky and i thought yeah that's that's probably me um so i was quite pleased yeah so i'd read every single one of the books i think i was the only one of the four of us that had read them all a uh, long time before i even auditioned uh, and had since you've been on the the uh, original adaptation of it, have you seen any of the other versions since? Well, yes. Um, so I saw before uh, I did the famous five. I saw there was a sixties version. I hadn't seen the fifties version. It was a fifties film and a sixties film, and I'd seen the sixties film years ago on the TV. I think it was a children's film foundation thing, um, and then subsequently. When the 90s series happened, there was a point in the 1990s, there was one year, I think, where both The Phoenix and the Carpet and The Famous Five both got remade. And I was sitting there, it would be about 1994 or 95, 
sitting there thinking my entire childhood is being remade in front of me. Um, but I watched some episodes of The Famous Five, which I enjoyed. Uh, and then, for some weird reason that I don't, can't honestly remember, oh, it's Ken. It was the launch of an Enid Blyton magazine that was being done, I think probably by Marvel. It was after I'd left working for Marvel. Um, and I was invited to go to the launch. And at the launch were the kids from the 90s version. And I was sort of hanging back in the corner, uh, not really getting involved in anything. And Paul, uh, who played Dick in the 90s version, walked up to me and he went, you're Gary Russell, aren't you? And I said, yes. How do you know that? And he said, well, because when we were doing our version, they made us watch yours. So all four of us sat and watched it. And I then got, so I got chatting to him and um, I got chatting to all of them, really. Um, and it was really nice just to sort of hang out for an evening with my replacements. <laughs> um, and they were a nice bunch of people. Yeah. And and do you think that the, are you going to watch the new version when it comes out? I'm I'm intrigued by it because, again, they're doing it, period. Um, whereas the 90s version was definitely 40s, 50s looking, which is probably what the book should be. Looking at the photographs, and all I've seen of these photographs of the new one, it looks like they're sitting in the 30s. Um, so, yes, that could be quite interesting. And it, the thing about Famous Five is you can do any number of things with it. You can make it modern. You can make it period. You could, you could probably set it in Victorian times, really. Uh, because it's the stories that work. They don't rely on technology. They don't rely on anything that dates them. They, you know, the, one of the reasons that Blyton's books still sell today is because you can read a Famous Five book or a Secret Seven book or an Island of Adventure book, and there's no mobile phones and there's no cars particularly or anything like that. So they never feel dated and they never feel un unapproachable by any audience at any time. They are they're very cleverly written to be timeless. And therefore I think that also makes them ideal for adaptation into film or TV. And I, I'm also really intrigued to see how, how they make because the, the last time they made famous five films were the German I think they were German the German films the last, last time they were made. So I'm intrigued to know how the uh, BBC did it. But how long was the filming days? When you were actually filming the series, how long did it like take you? do all the filming the first series took 13 weeks in 1977 and the second series in 78 took 14 weeks um but the second half of that final week we didn't do anything because we'd finished um and then we had a nice big party at the end uh so yeah and, and in both cases it was sort of the summertime to avoid too much crossover with school um and we got shipped off down to the new forest and and had fun and because I was fractionally old, I was playing the second youngest. Yeah. And I was older than the other kids, which meant that for whatever strange the way things were done back in the 70s with, with the amount of hours that children could work across a whole year, meant that I could work half an hour longer than the others. So if they ever had stuff that, that needed just me, they'd leave it to the end of the day because they'd all finish at 5 and I could go until 5.30. But this had the benefit for me of if ever there was a script under running, and this happened a couple of times, or they just wanted to change something, they'd write new sequences. And those new sequences would always feature just me, yeah. um, which was very handy. And I and I quite enjoyed that. I thought, oh, I get to climb on the top of this building, or I get to get kidnapped, and I get a couple of solo shots walking through a tunnel because I could work for half an hour longer than the others, which I thought was good fun. And did you ever watch yourself back once these episodes were airing? Yes. Terrifying. So, uh, you know, these days we think nothing about video recorders and DVD recorders and streaming and everything. Well, back in 1978, it, uh, when we were filming the second series, the first series started to go out. Um, really, domestic video recorders weren't commonplace in 1978. So halfway through filming the second series this man arrived on a I think it was a Monday evening or maybe it was a Wednesday evening it wasn't the first season out on Wednesday and he arrived on this Wednesday evening with what I now know to be a massive great big early uh, domestic home video recorder and they had taped it for us so that when we'd finished filming 
we could sit down and and watch the first episode when it went out and obviously for the next i think it was probably the next five or six weeks while we were filming he came around every week with that day's episode to show it to us and that was the first time we'd seen any of it because of course we'd made it a year before well when you're when you're an adult you know a year ago is nothing but when you're 13 14 years old a year ago seems a hell of a long time ago and there was so much stuff that we'd forgotten so much stuff and we had no idea how things were edited together and and you know what was going to get cut out and what wasn't um so it was great fun to sit and watch it and and as a tv freak i think i was probably watching it slightly closer i think the other the other three were probably watching going oh my god this is us we're in the home like look we're on television this is fantastic and i was looking at it going oh that lighting doesn't match and Oh yeah, that day when only shooting is really not good. You can see the sun in the corner of that. And, oh look, there's a boom shadow in the corner. How did that get in? And oh look, there's a man holding that horse, and he's not supposed to be in that shot because there's not supposed to be anyone in that room with that horse. Things like that. Um, because I was just a very boring, anally retentive TV freak, even at the age of fourteen. Because uh, I love television, and I and I love the art of television. And uh, I, I probably got this horrifically wrong, but we'll, we'll still go with it. But how was the... Uh, were you involved in making the theme tune? No. No. Nothing to do with us at all. Um, that was, uh, to my knowledge, and I and I say this, I have to, you know, say that. My understanding, because this is what I was told at the time, is that that was the choir from the Corona Stage School in West London. And they sung it. Nothing to do with us at all, other than the fact that Jennifer, who played Anne, actually went to Corona, but she doesn't sing on the thing because we were busy filming. They actually did it. Um, it was done early 1978 because I remember having a conversation with the producers about the theme tune, not necessarily hearing it. But maybe we did. Maybe they played it just. But talking about uh, there, there were two or three potential theme tunes. And we were just having conversations about it. And then... The first time, yeah, the first time we heard it was that first time we watched episode one going out. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> I didn't think it was, I don't like it. It's not a piece of music that particularly makes me go, oh, it's exciting. And I've got to say that when for the next four years you'd walk around shops and, you know, I'd go up to London and go around video stores and things like that, and people would be walking behind you humming or singing the famous five tune. I did learn to hate that piece of music, even because um, it's not great. It really isn't. And do you reckon that um, Big Finish will ever make a sequel series with all of you back in it? No, no, <laughs> that would be terrible. We'd be the old, we'd be the famous five, age sixty, walking around on Zimmer frames. So people saying, catch those burglars. And we began, oh, I don't think so, Sonny. I don't think we can quite move fast enough. Um, we did actually, uh, it wasn't me, it was, it was Jennifer. She got in touch with the producers of the new version, the BBC version that's been done at the moment, and suggested that the three of us were sat in the background in a cafe or something like that. We thought that would be, be quite fun, particularly since it's being made here in Cardiff. Um, uh, but they weren't interested in having us, and that's fair enough. Uh, but that would have been quite fun. Yeah. But you could have a famous five universe. It's like, it's like the MCU, but just for, for all the kids that were in the famous five at any point. A, a multiverse. We'd get together all the, 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 the 70s version, the 90s version, the 60s version, the German version, and now this new version. And we could all meet on some kind of big anniversary and stare at each other and, and, and try and work out why we all look so completely and utterly different. Uh, yeah, that would be great fun. Um, or you go the other way and you create an Enid Blyton universe and you have the famous five meeting the secret seven and Noddy. Um, you know, all these kind of mad things could happen. Actually, let's not suggest that because someone will probably try and do it. They probably would, but, but the one thing that no one wants to ever remember is the cartoon version, um, which wasn't that great. Well, you know, it's funny... A lot of Enid Blyton fans hated the cartoon version. I thought they did it quite well. In a, in a modern updating with mobile phones and, and all the modern technology, and obviously it, they weren't the famous five, they were meant to be generationally either their kids or their grandkids, I can't remember which way around it is. Um, 
I didn't. I didn't hate it. I, I've I've seen versions of Famous Five uh, that I disliked more than the cartoon version. I thought the cartoon version was quite fun for what it was. Yeah. And do you, um, as as the answer might already been answered, but do you still keep in contact with your co-stars? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the last time we all got together was Christmas, uh, which now I'm thinking about it is eight months ago. Uh, but to me, it seems like yesterday. Uh, but yes, myself. And Jennifer and Marcus uh, met up with Gail and Richard, who were two of the writers on the show. And we all had uh, a little pre-Christmas dinner in London. Um, and we do that every every few years. And, and I'm in touch with Marcus quite a lot anyway, because we're both on Facebook and we chat to each other. And we're both on a couple of uh, Facebook Famous Five uh, uh, pages as well. Because, you know, this, we're talking ego here. And therefore, if there's a page devoted to me on <laughs> Facebook, course i'm going to be on there talking to people because it's like that's a picture of me <laughs> um so yeah he and i sort of talk every so often uh but jennifer i only see every few years because she she's not social media kind of person um and and you know i talked to gail i said one of the writers an awful lot um and then richard we see when he comes over to london and and we all get together and uh, do you reckon you'll ever do what uh, a lot of american people doing Korea, or American people that were in programs where the majority of the cast were basically children. Will you ever do a quote unquote rewatch podcast of the famous fight? No one has ever asked us to do that. That would be interesting. So when it came out on DVD, which is now 12, 13 years ago, I think it came out. Um, that was the second attempt to get it out on DVD. There'd been an attempt a couple of years earlier by a different company. And for them, we'd gone down somewhere, myself, Jennifer and Marcus, and we'd done some commentaries on, on various episodes, which was enormous fun. I loved it. The idea of doing commentaries. Hey, the idea of watching myself on television and talking about myself, of course I loved it. Um, so we did these commentaries, but that version of the DVD never happened. And when the other people took over and they got the rights to release it and we said well look go to that other company they've got we recorded i think six commentaries on different episodes and they're just sitting there doing nothing but the company weren't interested so they didn't do commentaries um on the on the eventual box set which i thought was a big shame because you had the the three of us there and and we could edit, but instead we just did a big interview uh with gail i think gail was on the interview as well uh which was nice but i I love the idea of doing commentaries. So yeah, a podcast where we sit down and watch ourselves and uh, yeah, that appeals to my ego so much and I suspect Marcus would be up for it and I imagine Jennifer would probably say, I'll do one or two, but not anymore. Whereas Marcus and I would probably sit down and cry, right, let's do all 26 episodes. Yeah. And for anyone that's got this far and still hasn't seen the version, what on earth have you done with your life? But it is available on BritBox for anyone that... Uh... Yeah, and if you hunt around, you can still find it on Shiny Disc as well. You can. Uh, the one on Amazon I saw was £126. Well, you see, that's how much you have to pay for high-quality, sophisticated, <laughs> elegant entertainment. That's clearly the correct price. Yeah, and that was for a new version. For the ones that were, like, collectible, slightly new, it was £40. <sighs> So it's uh, price completely price shifts, but it's well worth the money if you have and it. A BritBox, yeah, go and watch it on BritBox. Um, I think the BritBox versions are the original UK versions, whereas the version that's on the DVD are actually the German versions. Um, the, they use the German prints, so they've been cleaned up. They, oh, in fact, they in Germany it was released on Blu-ray because they completely 4K'd it. It looked gorgeous. Um, but it also means that there's no advert breaks, and as a result, there's a there's a few episodes, there's about half a dozen of the episodes are extended slightly uh, because they had extra material that cut got cut out of the UK one to make room for adverts. Um, but the German prints have got extra scenes in. Yeah, and uh, we all know that the Germans love famous five. So it's astonishing the the the, the fandom in Germany. Uh, well, actually, the fandom in Europe. Is, is huge, France and, and Spain as well. But Germany is an absolute um, hotbed of Enid Blyton fandom. And so why why do you think that Enid Blyton's so 
uh, beloved and so well liked, and adaptations work so well to screen and film. Well, as I say, I think it's because when she was writing the books, she was smart enough to to somehow either she was clever and she knew this, or it was completely accident. I'm never quite sure. But she made all her books for kids, and I don't I don't include Noddy in this and wishing wishing tree and all that sort of stuff. But your famous fives and your secret sevens and Island of Adventures and, and that sort of nine to thirteen year old books. Uh she made them timeless. She lit she made sure that there was nothing in them that could ever date other than the language, there's nothing in them to date them, to make them go. They couldn't be as relevant and enjoyable in, in twenty twenty three as they were in nineteen fifty three. That's that's an art. That's clever to do that. And that's why they survived. And they've survived controversy and they've survived librarians refusing to do it. And for many years, the BBC wouldn't, you know, even talk about Brighton because they just thought she was this terrible writer who wrote these patronising stories for kids. But of course, time has proven that, that they were wrong and, and Brighton was right all along. And now, now the BBC has Mallory Towers, which is their highly phenomenally successful and very and like the famous five i think very cleverly kept in period but updated and and you know that's how you make good television is is to to straddle that line very carefully and i think mallory towers clearly did that and i think famous five looks like it's doing it as well yeah and do you do you look back on these memories of being in it with fond memories or or do you look back and think oh i could have done this better i could have done that better well, that's two different questions. Um, do I look back fondly on it? Enormously. I loved it and I'm proud of it. And, and yeah, I I worship it. Um, uh, do I look at it and go, my God, we could have done that better? Absolutely. I'm terrible in it. I'm not the world's greatest actor. Um, but also you look at it from a technical point of view and you go, well, this is made by Southern TV, who weren't one of the big players for kids' drama. They'd done freewheelers in the early 70s and, like, not very much in between. Um, it was obviously used on very, very cheap film stock. Um, and, and they, you know, it was at the time it was made, it was the most expensive children's program ITV had ever done, which is quite interesting because you do think, I wonder where that money went because it didn't go on the film stock, but it, because it was all location based and we went round and round, we, we basically, there wasn't very many places in Hampshire and a little bit of Dorset that we didn't film at. So that, that was that was quite freeing, and that shows on screen. I think the money, to the most part, shows on screen. I just wish they could have used some decent sort of 32 mil film instead of what looked like reused 16 mil. Yeah. And when you're out and about on the street, uh, do you still get recognised for that, or do you now get recognised for your other work? I don't get recognised at all, uh, which is brilliant and how it should be i certainly don't get recognized for famous five unless someone knows and then they kind of look and go well you know you're 60 now you were 13 then you know no 60 year old looks the same as they did when they were 13 so no no one's going to walk up to me and go oh you were the famous five but once they know if it's something they watched then they're quite animated and excited by it and i don't get recognized in the street for anything doctor who wise because why would i you know i'm People get recognised the people in front of cameras, and, and my in front of camera life was over and done with by about 1982. Uh, so everything I've done subsequently has been as far behind the camera as you can possibly get, which is where I like it. Uh, so no, I I don't get recognised anywhere, and I quite like that. And uh, if so say for example the the BBC get the rights to your version to be able to release on DVD to do some sort of like marketing ploy to get the new version sold uh, and get people to see it. Would you ever want to uh, do uh, like appear in a documentary like what the type of stuff that Chris Chapman? Yeah, I, I, I will always very happily and very positively talk about anything to do with Famous Five uh, for, for whatever it is uh, because I think it deserves a bit of praise and a bit of um, reconsideration. Yeah, exactly. Because I think... What what it needs if we if we're gonna get a successful DVD release in the UK that's uh, beautiful and in 4K we need that uh, we should be able to create we need to hire Chris Chapman to make do- documentaries about it because they're incredible and they and it'll it'll just match up perfectly and and yeah I mean, I'd love to do something with Chris like that that would be brilliant 
Uh, yes, you've got to find the right people to do it, to who'd actually want it, to pay for it. But yes, Chris would be the perfect person. Chris and Toby Haydock together could do one of their uncovering the famous five and, and, and the three of us could all meet up and, and sit and talk about it, having a picnic or something like that. That, that would be fantastic. Because um, I actually just imagine that now. That would be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it would be the greatest thing ever. That that may be, you may be just pushing that a little bit far, but it would definitely be fun. It would definitely be fun. It would be. And um, would you reckon that um, it will ever come, do you reckon there'll ever be an event at the BFI about the show, like they've done, like they've done in the past with some other quite niche, even niche programmes and that? Well, Curiously, I suggested this uh, to Justin at the BFI when it was 40 years ago, not 40, sorry, when it was the 40th anniversary of Famous Five, uh, which was 2018, I suppose. Uh, and there was no interest really at all. Um, and he tried. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, the 50th anniversary of the show will be in 2028. Um, by then, you know, I'll be half dead. Uh, <laughs> So you, th these kind of things only really happen with anniversaries. I think the only thing you could do is if the BFI did something to launch the new series and asked various people from the previous ones to turn up and wave a claw and say, oh, yes, I remember it well, and look at all these young people. Um, I think we could probably do that. You can do one of those videos where you give advice to your new incarnation of the role you say oh here's here's what i learned from doing the role and and then i could i could i could be on a screen and i could look down at, at all the various people that have played dick over the years and go so you're my replacements are you yes a dandy and a clown i could do it just like that and i'd be in a little triangular bubble thing that would be great fun yeah it would be or, or it would or it would make a cracking trailer for the new version but more likely They'd actually go, no, we don't want Gary. We'll replace him with some lookalike who eats pineapple really badly, and and you know that would be my life in a in a nutshell. Yeah, and so from your time working on the show, when you were on set, on the ground, sniffing the grass, um, and whatever playful things you want to do, <laughs> that's a whole different way of talking about the way that young children actors are. Yeah, sniffing the grass. Yeah, I mean that never happened. We were very pure. What was your favourite memory of uh, working on set of the show? Um, uh, I, I've i got to be very cheap and obviously I could say, I mean, for the most part, I was working with the actors because we had such brilliant actors. Every, everyone was adorable. Uh, and I got to work with Patrick Charles on, which was kind of cool. Uh, and everyone going, don't talk to him about Doctor Who. He doesn't like talking about Doctor Who. So of course I went straight over, talked about Doctor Who, got to sign my copy of uh, the Abominable Snowman Target novelization. I still have on a shelf over there. And he was lovely, and we talked about Dr. Fowers. But my my favourite moment, really, and this comes back to, to, to that thing about having a huge ego uh, and it being all about me, was shooting the title sequence. Because, you know, oh, Mark has got to swim on a rope and, and Mish got to ride her bike and, and Jennifer's on the back of a horse, except she isn't, she's actually on somebody's shoulders. Um, and the dog eats the sausage, and I got taken to the middle of a pond, a huge lake in the in in down in Hampshire, sent out by myself on a raft with the camera crew sort of half a mile away, and then they go and can you fall in the water? So I fell in the water, and then they brought the raft back in, and I changed clothes and got dried off and had an identical set of clothes, and then me and the cameraman went out and we did it all over again, and can you fall in the water? So, and I just thought this was the greatest in the world. All they want me to do is have fun and fall in the water. That was my favourite thing of all was actually shooting that because I was on my own and I just got to get wet all the time and it was brilliant. Was they say the only thing in this it never worked with children and dogs. Now obviously you roll children so you were working together, so that, that doesn't apply to this scenario. But what was it like working with the dog? The dog, uh Toddy was just so well trained there was nothing he couldn't do uh there was never a point where you sit down and go the dog's holding anything up the dog was the best of all of us in quite seriously the dog was never had any tantrums never had any sulks and and just did his job so the dog was fine i loved working with toddy he was brilliant the only things i never enjoyed working with 
because we did have quite a few other animals at various times, is I am not, I was fine because I'd never encountered them before. I thought I would be fine with monkeys and I wasn't. And I, and I have to say that chimpanzees, of which we had major ones across the, the both series, and then we had a little, I don't know what, it was something sat on, on a character called Tinker's shoulder. I don't know what kind of monkey it was. I hated them. I absolutely detest with every fiber of my being chimpanzees and monkeys generally um because i just i just oh no every other animal we had we had elephants uh we had other dogs we had cats we had everything they were all lovely monkeys of any kind any kind of ape or chimpanzee or anything like that no thank you i i run a mile and and mo- monkeys. Well, when you when you watch them on the screen, the mo- the monkeys seem like the cutest things ever. But you can just imagine you watch you, you see Planet of the Apes, and they're probably evil, probably evil things. You you do realise that in Planet of the Apes, they're not real apes. Those are men in costumes. You, yeah, you, you've understood that, haven't you? It's yeah. almost Andy Circus, all you know, on CG. Don't don't think they're real apes. They're not quite that clever. No, the uh. That you can in the first film you can certainly tell they're not real, but then but then technology gets better and then the monkeys get more monkeyish rather than humanish. Uh like that uh Chinese uh, bear that's probably a human that everyone puts you in on a yeah. <laughs> in his wrinkled suit. <laughs> yeah. And, and so was what was like the the atmosphere like for you once it had come out and you went back to school was were you were you like the like king of the the school, and you were walking around, and everyone was swooning over you and wanted your autograph? Or was it like no one? God no, they they just sat and took the Mickey out of me the whole time, and and just you know treated me like the idiot that I am. No, there was there was none of that, um, which is good because uh, I would have been deeply uncomfortable if there'd been any of that. I mean, there was a lot of when it was on TV. Obviously, there was a lot of piss taking and a lot of laughing and joking and that, that was fine i didn't care about that um but no i wasn't treated any differently uh by by the by my my classmates at all um and interestingly interesting interesting is the wrong word curiously they were not interested no one actually ever sat down and went what was it like was it fun did you have a good time it was like oh gary goes off and does these tv things and the rest of us go off and do sport you know um so it wasn't something that anyone talked about. It wasn't something that anyone was particularly proud of. It was just, that's what I did because, you know, I was a bit weird and I liked Doctor Who and I went off and became an actor and, you know, it all got bunched up in that same sort of a, oh, that's just Gary. He's a little bit bit, bit weird. We've chosen to find it charming. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, that, was, that was my school life. And when, because I, I don't, I've, because I, I don't know the history of schools, so so what I'm about to say might not work well as a, as a question. But I'll go with it. Well, when you because when you're in English, when I was in high school, which uh, was probably four years ago, um, because uh, I'm not as as old as I seem, <laughs> um, and we we you did those things where you when you read a book and you learned about the book because you were learning about English. Did yeah. you did did you ever uh learn? Did you ever have to read out parts of of your dick from the books when you're in no because the 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 the, the age i was when i was doing english literature and english language when i was getting ready for my o levels so so let's say between 14 and and 16 um the, the famous five would not have been on the syllabus because that was for eight and nine year olds uh so no when i was at school we would we were doing the woman in white and the mayor of castle bridge and things like that um but i i the one thing i got at i suppose of the whole act, acting thing really was that I uh, I got a very good flair for English, particularly uh, English language, um, and I was very creative writing at school, and 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 that was definitely at school was something that the teachers could see in me, because I think I just had well, if you want a serious answer to this, one of the things that comes out of being a child actor more often than not, you are spending most of your life with grown-ups you are not spend you know most people have their summers and they're hanging out with their peers and yes there were four of us and we were roughly the same age but we was working and we were working there was the four of us and then there was 45 grown-ups 
to what were grown up to us. Half of them probably only 19 or 20. To us, that seemed grown up. Um, so you mature very, very quickly. Your approach and your way of dealing with things and your language uh, grow, you, you grow up quite quickly. So I found when I was at school that not that everyone else is childish, but from a from a learning point of view, and particularly doing English language and English literature, my vocab and my uh, approach to things was probably a couple of years older than everyone else I was at school with. And that's just because when you spend your formative years with no one but grown-ups around you, you age that little bit quicker. And I don't think, obviously, I didn't think that then, but that's something that I've realised looking back now and going, oh, you really were a smug little shit. And that's because you kind of, you pick stuff up and you, and you behave and you talk like a grown-up slightly more than other 14, 15-year-olds did. And how has being on The Famous Five and doing TV as a child and learning about the industry from a from a from like an action point of view, so you are getting to do the work and learning what other people did. How did that? How did that help you later on when you when you went on to do other things? Well, I think I, even by the time I was doing Famous Five, I had decided that I probably wouldn't be an actor forever. I didn't have any great ambitions at that stage. That late on, I think, eight on fourteen, uh, that I was going to be acting until I was sixty. So I was already wanting to look behind the scenes and I quite like directing I thought you know the person who's in charge and tells everyone else what to do hmm that sounds like a pretty good job to me and there was one particular episode in the second series where I was half out of it because I'd been kidnapped and I had about three or four days where I wasn't working so I went up and sat in the editor's room because the editing was all done on site and I watched how the editors put stuff together and I realized then oh that's why the cameraman that's why the director shoots that way. That's why he shoots that way. That's why he got us to do that four times. And all these things that when you're a child acting and people have a sticky camera at you, say, do this, then do this, you do it without thinking. Obviously, you just do what you're told. Being in those editing suites and watching it being put together and suddenly understanding why they do Oh, that's why we did that take four times from different angles. That cuts together. Oh, blah, blah. And then from that point onwards... I was able to talk to, or probably annoy enormously, all the directors, because they'd say, right, we want to do it like this, and then I'd start to say things like, why? Because you've already got it from that angle, and, and why would you want to do it from this angle? And they'd just look at me and go, could you just do it, please? And I'd go, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was already formulating, and I would watch how the directors worked much more closely, and I really began to say, oh, I can see it again. This is, this is my my passion and my understanding of television as an art form, I really started to get a good grip of everything that went on behind the scenes. Whereas I think prior to that, I was just the actor and someone would come over and say, wear these clothes and someone would come over and say, we're going to put a light here. And, and you just took it for granted. And after I'd done that four days in the editing suite and then started talking to editors and directors, I got an idea of what everybody did and how everybody's job dovetails into this sort of collaborative effort um and that was very important for me and made me realize that if i wasn't going to carry on being an actor then i one way or another i wanted to work behind the scenes in some form in the media and i have done ever since i've stayed in the media doing you know ten thousand different jobs and no one can ever say i've had a career um but i have permanently stayed in the media in some form since i was 14 years old well actually since i was 10 years old when i first started and and do you um look back at, at your time on the show and 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 think and like and see think do you like think to yourself oh I could have done it better I could have done it this and, and have you seen like who now I do now I, I I look at episodes sometimes and think why I don't know whether I look at myself and I mean I said that earlier I don't think I'm particularly brilliant as an actor in it so I can look back on that and go oh god performance why didn't you do that line better. But I do sometimes look at the episodes and think, I wonder why that choice was made to shoot at that angle or why that choice was made to shoot that as day for night when it would have worked much better. Or if they'd put the camera three inches to the left, that tree would have blotted out the sun completely and therefore it really would have looked like a night shot. All of these things, I will, I will watch it. I, I watch it with a 
critical with a small c i and and try and work out why things are. I don't sit there and go that was terrible and write it off if something and, and this is true of not just famous five but everything i've ever been involved in i will look at it and go i'm intrigued to know why that decision was made because it was clearly the wrong decision or there must have been a reason why something that now looks so logical but they didn't do that so there must have been an external force that maybe it was going to rain maybe the there wasn't a level enough ground to put the camera dolly on or whatever there must have been a reason why they didn't shoot it this way um but that's just me having my, my critical eye on television generally not just stuff i've been involved in i'll watch most tv from the 60s and 70s and kind of be quite fascinated as to why decisions were made do you think that the books uh the, the tv series either is very faithful to some books or do you reckon it it's no. mostly it fell off track not at all. Not with our one. They were more faithful in the 90s, I think. Um, but, you know, it's very hard to condense, uh, what would they be? They'd be about 50,000, 55,000 word books, I suppose. Trying to condense that into 30 minutes, uh, that's 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 pretty damn hard. Plus, you've updated it. Uh, so you've got to lop whole storylines out and move things around. And certainly by the second season, I think the first series... They probably tried to stick as close to the books as they could. With the second series, once they got hang of the way the four of us worked and interacted with each other and, and what dialogue did and didn't work for us, I think we took, I think the writers took a much more um, preceded approach to the book and, and made it fit the TV show, which is why I think the second series is much better. Um, because it, it didn't have the, it has the titles, it has the characters, it has the basic storylines of the books, but allows them to develop for television rather than trying to, to slap a 1950s book in front of a camera. Yeah. And do you reckon that if they ever wanted to bring you all back, do you reckon that you could ever see the, um, joke version of the famous five books that I've taken? So for instance, five go to Brexit <laughs> Island, whatever. <laughs> Um, no, I think they work very, very well as a, as a bit of as, as literary. I don't think you could actually, <laughs> don't think you could adapt them. Or, I mean, the case of Brexit Island, it'd be a very, very boring book because you'd just be sat down talking for, for three hours. Um, but uh, I like those books. A lot of Enid Blanton fans took great umbrage at them, which is guaranteed to make me like them even more. Um, but I thought they were good fun books. Uh, I thought they were very cleverly they they pastiched the style of Blyton without ridiculing it, and I thought that was quite a, a smart line to to straddle. And do you why? How come the the series came to an end? Um, well, <laughs> we ran out of books. Um, we would they wanted to do Southern wanted to do a third series because they talked to us about taking up an option on us and everything and. Obviously, we would have been 15 by then. I'd have been coming up for 16. Uh, we were probably reaching the, the end of our TV shelf life as, as believable kids at that point. But we could have done another another year. We could have had a, a, a 1979 series as well, I think. Um, but the Blyton estate uh, put their foot down and said, no, we weren't allowed to make up new stories. Um, they would only allow us to adapt stuff and... I think there was three we didn't do, two because we couldn't get the rights to them because John's Film Foundation had them, and one we didn't do because it's not very good. Uh, so there was nothing else for us to do. The irony being that no sooner had that happened than the estate then went off and commissioned a whole load of new novels yeah. from, from someone in France, uh, which were terrible, but ironically set in the 70s. Uh, so you'd like Famous Five visit a TV studio and, and Famous Five go on a cable car and all this sort of stuff. Um, and we and I remember sitting there thinking, well, hang on a minute. You told us we couldn't do new stuff for TV, but you've just told this person they can go off and write a whole load of new books. Um, but yeah, so sadly, the, the the choice to end it came from the estate. It didn't come from Southern TV, and it certainly didn't come from us. Yeah, and and once the episodes had aired and we, it had been recorded, did, you, did they give you um, a version of it to keep as a? Nope. Nope. I saw every single episode when it was transmitted at the time and a couple of repeats. Uh, and it wasn't until the first 
VHS copies came out in 83, I think, the first domestic, the first commercial VHS releases. Um, and we had to buy them. We didn't get sent them. We got sent the covers. That was very nice. Oh, look, here's a cover. And we not have what's inside it. Uh, so I remember going down, uh, I think with my mum, to... Where we had gone? It would have been Woolworths in Maiden. It would have been Woolworths. And buying the VHSs so we could watch them again. And of course, the VHSs were terrible. They were awful, awful quality. They were like 10th generation prints. They were very dark and murky. Um, they were very badly edited because they were taken from, again, the UK rather than the German sources. Uh, so they had the advert breaks, but they were cut out with what appeared to be a pair of garden shears and glued together with sellotape. So those early VHSs were, were really bad releases. It wasn't until the, the 2012 uh, DVD release that the show got a really good, pristine, best it could probably be print. And do you own, because you can buy these multi-region DVD players, do you own any of the German uh, yep. DVDs? Uh, I haven't, no, I haven't got the Blu-rays, uh, but I've got the UK DVDs, I've got the German DVDs, I've got the French DVDs, and I think I've got the Italian DVDs, um, because that's how egotistical I am. I have to own every copy of myself dubbed into a foreign uh, language, including, interestingly enough, it's either the French or the Italian one, is that I'm played by a woman. Um, because obviously, you know, they want you to sound young and your voice hasn't broken, which of course mine had by the second series. Uh, so you would, I was dubbed by a woman. Whereas was Julian, uh, he was dubbed by a bloke. But, you know, the three, the two, the two girls and me were all dubbed by women. And I thought, well, thanks very much, Italy. That's very kind. I'll, I won't live that one down. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I've got all of those. Um, yeah. And do you now, since it's been available on BritBox, a, a, more, a, a more faster way to, to press play on it rather than getting your DVD out and putting it out? I love DVDs, but uh, for this context... Uh, Britbox is fascinating. Do you still re rewatch every so rewatch some episodes? I don't have Britbox, uh, so no. Uh, if I want to watch them, I will have to go out and get the shiny disc and press slot it in, press play, sit down, change the input channel. Blah, blah. Uh, no, I don't sit down and watch them very often. I, I, for, for what reason was I can't think what the reason was. I actually did a blitz and watched all twenty six episodes. I think I was talking to a couple of people about it. Um, we've been down location hunting over the last few years with, with three or four uh, famous five fans who I'm working out where everything was filmed. And because of that, I sat down and blitzed all 26 episodes. But I don't sit down and watch them on a, on a regular basis. Kind of know them backwards, really. At least I always think I do. And then someone will show me a photograph and go, what episode is this from? And I go, I have no idea. Um, and I try and work out from what terrible costumes I was wearing, what episode it might be. And I'm usually wrong. And so, do you do you still get uh, fans still coming to talk to you? Obviously, there's a fan here, but uh, do you get like other fans coming up to you to still talk about it? Not not face to face, no. Um, I say the, the the there's a very good uh, Facebook group specifically for the the seventy seven seventy eight series uh, on Facebook, and I'm a member on there. And I did a um, a Zoom chat with about twenty five of them last year and that was great fun and that was really nice um and then usually once a year last couple of years i've done it once every two years i'll go back down to the new forest with these these brilliant fans who work out where the locations were and i'll go around with them um not because i'm sitting there going no guys you've got this wrong we didn't film this here because actually they know more than i do and i sit there going wow yeah i think you're right this is the place oh my god i suddenly remember this this and this um and occasionally we'll meet people who lived there back in the in 1977 and still live there today. And they'll say, oh, I remember you when you were this high. Um, and that's quite nice. Yeah. And so when you go to these walk-ins, are they still the same as they were? Or is it like what they did with the Teletubbies? Uh, it, when they varies. it really varies. Most of them, I have to say, are pretty much the same. It's the new forest. I don't think it changes a great deal. Um, a couple of them we walked on to and gone, yeah, this bears no... One we went to a couple of years back was a farm that we'd used and has been now completely converted into an art gallery. So the only thing that's the same is the outside of the building. The insides are all completely different. But that was fascinating. That was absolutely fascinating to walk around that and work out 
and and the owners of the gallery were going, can you work out where you filmed? Because we had the guys I was with, they brought photographs of the of the of the locations, and realizing we could actually work out from the inside structure of this art gallery which bit had been which back in 1978, and that was quite fun. On the whole, most of them, uh, with with obviously wear and tear of 40 years, they're reasonably recognisable. Yeah, and and I'm quite glad about that because some TV shows, uh, namely Tots TV, had abandoned the building that they had, that the Tots lived in, and it was flooded, and 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 people then thought it was a good idea to make spooky uh, videos on YouTube about the discovering it and pretending there's a ghost of uh, one of the Tots uh, floating about, uh, and then the Tony Tubbies one uh, that I mentioned before had been flattened because it was supposed to be a secret location, but the Fans found out where it was, so they had to flatten it, so no one would know it was there. So they met ten to a pond. Yeah, no, our ones are because most of them are private dwellings. People tend not to knock them down. Um, they, I say, they change them quite a lot, but they're mostly recognisable for, from when we were there because it's that part of the country where things don't need to change. And when you go to visit these locations, do you feel like? Uh, all the memories are flowing back, or do you think that it, that it just reminds you of a, of a happy time in your life? Both. I mean, I do, I've got very good recall for stuff, uh, so I can usually remember what was done on what day and, and where we stood and where the cameras were and things like that, uh, which is a bit freakish when I think about it, but but I have got good recall for that. But it's just nostalgia. My entire life, I mean, I'm a Doctor Who fan, you know, and I, I spend my entire life writing and thinking about Doctor Who, and it's all because of nostalgia. Um, because it's it's taking me back to my childhood and 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 reliving it, and therefore the famous five thing is the same. It's a nostalgia thing for me to be able to go back and go. Forty five years ago, I was this high, and I was looking in that direction, and I was wearing that costume, and and here I am again now, and it hasn't changed. Um, and I really quite like that, but that's because I'm a nostalgia freak. I think if you took uh, Jennifer or Marcus back they would be much more detached. I think they'd sit there and go, oh, yes, I remember this. This was fun. Or they might go, oh, did we film here? Oh, I don't really remember that. Whereas for me, I, my entire life has been about nostalgia because I'm quite sad and empty and have nothing else in my life and they have families in real life. Uh, so for me, the nostalgia of going back and exploring my childhood is 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 great. And and you mentioned earlier that you had uh, worked with uh, the great one of the greatest uh, uh, actors that uh, sadly uh, is no longer with us. I say one of them because there's a, the, in a certain area there's a selection of three that I can think of at the moment in time. But there's probably more. Uh, what was it like working alongside the second Doctor himself? Well, it was great because I say he was he was lovely. He was just completely chilled. Um, he got to hit me, push me, throw me down a flight of stairs, and I got to tie him up. So we had a good laugh. Um, you know, we we just had that particular episode actually is very good because his wife in it was played by Mona Bruce, uh, who was a brilliant actress who I knew from within these walls and was very excited to be working with her um, as well. Uh, we were very lucky that we had casts that at the time were were the height of of you know everyone that was on television was in the famous five at that point it was like we were the more common wise that doctor who wasn't in those days everyone came to do an episode of the famous five and it was really nice um it's quite sad a few years back i was working out with with somebody uh who's still around and realizing that probably 85 percent of the guest cast in famous five are no longer with us um, and that's quite a sobering thing. That that brings you down to earth and you think, oh, because that is only 40 years ago and an awful lot of these people died very young, um, which is quite sad. Uh, but yes, there, there are entire episodes where I can look at them and go apart from the kids uh, and Aunt Fanny. Everyone else is gone. And was it, were you starstruck when you first met Patrick? <laughs> starstruck no i don't think so i don't think i don't remember being starstruck with him at all um i was honored i think and i was slightly in awe but i wasn't starstruck i i've never really been starstruck 
<laughs> I got starstruck a couple of times when I was running Big Finish. And I think that was the first time I'd ever actually experienced being starstruck. Um, but no, he was just so nice and so welcoming that he was just, oh, here's another one of our guest stars. And I don't think anyone else knew who Patrick Trout was in terms of the kids. But I was like, who's Doctor Who? Who's Doctor Who? Uh, so I was quite excited by that. Yeah. Uh, and and he, he, he was a fantastic uh, actor. And everything that he did was like uh, the holy shrine of uh, of acting in the Patrick Troughton era because he's the greatest man uh, on player after John Pertwee. Because um, you can't say anything bad about John Pertwee or else she'll get attacked by uh, scarecrows. Uh, <laughs> well, I met Pertwee for the first time when he was doing Wurzel because our entire crew, we finished on the Friday and on the Monday they started Wurzel Gummidge. Uh, and I went down to visit people about a year later, I suppose. Um, and that was the first time I'd ever met Pertwee. And he was lovely. He was really friendly. Uh, I got to be an extra in one episode of Wurzel Gummidge. It got cut out. Um, but yeah, he he was brilliant. Yeah. And do you reckon that working on the Famous Five was a springboard to for you to know what uh, what path? You, you wanted to do so like you you already had a small idea of what you wanted to do uh, after it but did this like help you to work out what what you needed to do to get to your your goal of what you wanted to do when you're a lot taller and older i don't yeah i mean i think i can say yes with hindsight i don't think i thought it at the time uh at the time i just thought this is exciting and and he's making me think about going behind the scenes but it, I don't think I sat down and thought, and this has been the launch pad, and this is this is my trajectory. That came much, much later. Um, but it evidently was. I mean, there's no getting away from that, that if I hadn't done Famous Five, then I wouldn't have done the stuff that followed, and then that wouldn't have led me to do various other things. And suddenly, here we are 45 years later, and, and I'm still working uh, in the media, and it's all because of being an actor when I started when I was 10. But Famous Five was a very large jumping point. And, and one of the nice things that came out of Famous Five was there was a handful of actors that I was able to work with at Big Finish. Um, and that was because I was able to say to him, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, back in 1978, we worked together on such and such. And they were like, yeah, I remember that. I remember you, but I'll still come and work with you at Big Finish, even despite that. And someone like Stephen Greif from, from Blake Seven, who I had stayed in touch with, those years uh, between doing Famous Five and, and working with him at Big Finish uh, you know and and uh, Bernard Holly was another he wasn't Phoenix, he wasn't Famous Five he was Phoenix in the carpet but I'd stayed in touch with him for very many years so it was obvious when Big Finish started I phoned him up and said right you know do you want to come and do a Big Finish with us um, so there are a handful of those actors that I just stayed in friends with because we'd got on really well when we were working together on the shows and when you when you worked at Big Finish and uh, when you needed to get new actors, did you did uh, did you try and uh, use Famous Five as a one well, try to say I did this, so come and work with me? No, no, I know I've never used anything I've done as a sort of bargaining chip because I don't think that really washes with other actors. Uh, and they go, yeah, well, you know, I've done sixteen thousand other things, but it did give me that option to say to a handful of people. Do you remember when we worked together all those years ago? Prentice Hancock was another one. Um, and, uh, you know, do you fancy meeting up for the first time in 45 years? And I'd like to employ you and, and, and give you a couple of days' work. Um, so that was always cool. And uh, with with the fans and, and talking to fans, do you, do you get a sense that they really appreciate what you've done for the, for the fandom rather than just being an actor that was in a programme? I, I, you know, I don't look at it like that. Um, I suppose so. I, I that doesn't really uh, resonate with me. I think they like it. <laughs> they don't seem to say, "Could you go away and leave us alone? We'd like to enjoy our Facebook page without you butting in every five minutes." So that hasn't happened. So that's probably quite nice. Um, I don't really sit and think about that from my point of view. I just think about it from their point of view because it's lovely that they like a show that I was involved with. Um, so that's just flattering. Um, I don't really I hope to God I don't come across as sort of hello. I was one of the famous five, and I'm desperately important, and you should all worship at my feet. I mean, obviously I think that, 
Uh, but I didn't think I would ever actually say that out loud. With um, the 50th anniversary coming up soon, um, if my calculations are correct, um, will you, you ever see a cast reunite on the news or something like to celebrate like what the original cast of the Narnia franchise did, the original BBC Narnia? I'm sure if they asked us, we'd all say yes. I don't think they ever will. I don't think <laughs> this show is quite that important to them. Um, I say they didn't do anything for the 40th, so I very much doubt they'll be worrying about it in the 50th because they'll have a new show to worry about. Yeah. And do you reckon that uh, having the the show still available and having the other versions somewhere, because I don't know where, I don't even know where you can watch the 90s version. You but... can on DVD, you can, you can buy it on DVD. It all got released. Or do you reckon that it brings uh, new fans to the show having it available for people to watch and you reckon new people will uh, fall in love with it like they did when it first broadcast? Well, that would be nice if they did. I, d I do think the problem with all these things is when you, you have a new 2023 version of something and you assume that people will then go back and look at the 1995 version or the 1977 version or the 1963 version or the 1954 version, unfortunately, the kids who are going to watch it in 2023 are going to look at anything from 1995, the 77 backwards and go, what is this primitive thing you're making us watch? They might as well have made it with finger puppets. Um, <laughs> because, you know, TV is sophisticated these days and, and casual TV made today to someone in 1977 when we were making Famous Five, that would look like a $50 million movie. And now it's just how you make TV. Um, so, I mean, I always think this with Doctor Who is, is with people who say, oh, I, I, I've only watched Doctor Who in the, the, since 2005, you know. Um, and you say to them, oh, you should go back and try the classic series. And some go back and try the classic series and fall in love with it and go, yeah, this is brilliant. Part of it. But a large percentage will sit down and go, yeah, I can't watch this. It's, it's, it's just, it's like it's held together with sellotape and, and, and this is not what television, I don't want to watch television like that. I want to watch television from from the 21st century and i completely understand that i i can totally see why the the tv as an art form has developed so much particularly in the last 20 years um so that everything looks like it's a million dollar movie i can see why no one wants to sit down and watch the horns of naimon um i put it nice the fact that you know Horns i was terrible but you know you wouldn't compare uh power of the doctor to the horns of naimon and go this is same show because Power of the Doctor looks like it should be on a movie screen and and cost forty eight million and Haunted Naimon is very much a four three should be on the TV probably would be better in black and white and looks like it was made for four pounds fifty uh, which it probably was so I understand why people watching modern Doctor who are not keen to go back and watch classic Doctor who, and I think that would be the same if you said someone watching Famous Five in twenty twenty three Christmas twenty twenty three now go back and watch the 1977 version and they'd say, I don't know what you're making us watch this for. This is not television. This is, this is not what we understand television to be. And, uh, and j just to uh, go on a point that if you were going to try classic who, and you were one of those people that were like, no, it looks terrible. I recommend you buy the Blu-rays as you can, if you're watching the video version, you can see in the background, buy them, watch it with the new effects, then you'll appreciate it. So, no, 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 no. You see, the trouble with the new effects, no disrespect to the people doing these new effects, some of whom I know and are going to kill me for saying this, but the trouble with the new effects is they're already dated and they've dated worse than the original effects. And I think the, the, I think the whole thing of putting new effects on things, for me, I think is, is, is a false economy because they 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 don't match they, they don't blend well with with the 60s or more importantly 70s wobbly doctor who anyway and they have dated you you look at the stuff that like was done for ark in space and watching those on the blu-ray and just going no that looks worse than the original because that's really early cg and it's still got thick lines around it and the, it doesn't match the film stock around it and i i think if I was recommending someone to watch classic Doctor Who, there's no way I'd say watch it with the new effects because they just don't, for me anyway, don't work. I'd say you have to watch it with 
uh, but you try and tell them to watch a story that, so you say, you know, if you're going to get someone to watch classic Doctor Who's never seen it before, I would say you sit them down with Terror of the Zygons or the Robots of Death and you say, watch this because this is Doctor Who at its best. And uh, to preface on that, I've never actually seen the new effects. I see them of oh, new effects, new effects, I think. It's too much effort going into... The... Well, there is that. Yes, I, I'm completely with you there. That, oh, I just want to press play and watch a Doctor Who. I don't want to go, do you want these effects? Do you want this soundtrack? Do you want it in 5.1 stereo? Do you want it in 2.0 stereo? Blah, blah, blah. No, I just want press play and off it goes. Yeah. And I still think, before we we move on, the greatest thing about the DVD is when the... Is when, cause it, cause it's a memory that will live with you forever of watching the DVDs. It's a bit where they have the actor that's either involved in the box set or or was available but was in Doctor Who saying, if you want some audio features, press enter now. Right. I still think that's like the most memorable bit of the DVD, other than the episodes and all the special features that are on the DVD. It, it's it's lovely Sue, Sue Kerr's voice at the beginning of those, um, uh, where she goes, Doctor Who, the face of evil. And you think, oh. And then there's a point where it's not Sue Kerr anymore. You're like, oh. That's when Sue Kerr must have left the BBC and someone else had to come in and go, Doctor Who, Sharda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and so um, before we uh, go into the slippery slopes that I call trying to end this glorious interview, um, with, with uh, say, for instance, as an example, that the... Um, that they needed to re-release the DVDs of your version, would you be happy to be the Suka of the Famous Five Lord and do the and Famous Five? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, Ella. I would do it in Sue's intonation as well. <laughs> Famous Five. Five go to Billy Cock Hill. What? That was just incredible. So, hopefully, if enough fans rabble around, we'll hopefully try and get some... Because I, th- I do think that every TV show that's niche and that has a big fan base needs Chris Chapman to make a documentary on them. But, by that definition, if something's got a big fan base, can it truly be considered niche? Um, Surely the whole concept of niche is that it doesn't have a big fan base, it has a small but very dedicated fan base. That's what I was trying to work out. When I was trying to plan what sort of programs I was going to do on this podcast, I had to work out what classes and niche. So the only ones I can think of at the beginning, before then, I then realised what niche was. Well, I didn't realise what niche was. I just went with whatever I, I knew of. I thought of, like, uh, Quater Maths and Adam Adamant. They class as niche, don't they? Yes. I mean, they're also cult. I, I think there's a, there's a fine line to be d- divided between niche and cult. Um, and cult will always have a big following, a dedicated, nobody in the great wide world has ever heard of Adam Adamant except people like us, um, and we have taste. And <laughs> yeah. um, Whereas niche, to me, would be like saying, you're going to do a podcast on Strange, or you're going to do a podcast on on the air, uh, you know, and, and you're going to find things that, only lasted for six episodes and got cancelled and 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 that to me would be niche yeah uh and so and so we, there we have it we now have the definition of niche so <laughs> no we have my definition of niche that doesn't make it right just because i said it does not make it right it's better than what google comes out with google just says a tv program that was on is no longer on it's, yeah. is that what google thinks niche is yeah. let's google well, that's ai for you isn't it and and so I, I, cause I, I thought of this idea because uh, it's, uh, uh, well, it's one, a good way for me to interview more people. And two, it's a good way for me to interview more people. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I like any excuse to interview uh, more people um, and try to interview people in other angles that haven't been uh, done to death, such as, um, such as, I can't think of anyone, uh, but people will know other people and so there we have it now with this podcast what is to come next before we do our fighting clothing times and all our other things? well we don't know because we we obviously uh, are waiting to hear back from certain people that 
are either no longer knocking about doing things or just their emails so all they want. So we don't know what will happen. So hopefully we'll end up getting people that were involved in programs such as, let's say, Dark Seats and uh, or people. And, and with this podcast, the way that it will work from now on is I'll interview people that are either involved in the program when it originally was made or people that were involved in an adaptation such as audio uh, so that it's still a first hand it's still an expert but they have to know what the program is and have to be uh, massive fans of it to begin with um, uh, so for instance Chris Chapman I've already interviewed him so I'll be trying to hunt down someone else that knows a lot about Dark Season but that's an example Toby Haydock I've already interviewed him but someone else that knows a lot about Peter Mac, uh if Mark Gatiss is watching uh, please get in touch um, I'd love to interview you. And so, thank you for letting me interview you. My pleasure, mate. Absolutely. This is a part of the show, uh, the interviews that I always do, where where you can tell people where can they find you, but don't give away your whole address. Uh, well, the best place to find me is on Twitter, uh, which is at Twilight Streets. Um, I'm also on Threads, which is at Twilight Streets 2008. Um, so they're the best two places to find me. And have you got anything upcoming that you would like people to either see, purchase, or buy? Um, I go out and buy Starbeast, uh, when it comes out, uh, because I'm very proud of that novelization. Um, other than that, I, I'm doing a couple of things for Big Finish at the moment, which is the first time for a very long time that I've been doing some scripting for them. Um, I did a short story a, a while back for them, for, for Colin and, and Bonnie, which was fun. Um, so yeah, I'm just sort of pottering around and, and doing a bit of writing here and a bit of writing there. And so before we end it, cause I, I'm going to kick myself if I ha- don't ask this, but have you seen the ep- the TV episode of Starbeast? I cannot answer that question. Oh, that's, that's the correct answer because then, then I, I can like clip that. And say, look at this! I can start. I can start rumors knocking about. Like I can, I can get people talking. It's uh, it's an average to get more people to see my stuff. Right, and then I shall kill you. <laughs> and so, I will actually hunt you down and and kill you. I mean, that's just, that's just the way the world works. You remember that series, Hunted? Yeah, that'll be you, and you'll be rummaging and run tr- trying to get away, and I'll be flying above with helicopters taking you out yes now that is another program I class as niche because before now when they think of haunted they think of the channel 4 reality tv show where people are being chased by a lot of cia acting men i like the original haunted where a bunch of people try and go off grid and get to a helicopter and fly out of the country and earn lots of money i've always thought i'd love to do that i think i'd be really good at that and all my friends looked at me and went no, you wouldn't. You'd be activating your phone in the first thirty seconds to get on. <laughs> and I like, no, I could, I could go off grid quite easily, and then realise that I couldn't because the first thing I'd do is walk into a shop and buy an awful lot of chocolate, and therefore my card would be used. Boom, I'd be found on the spot. Well, uh, and before I, uh, we end this, the US version, just just to briefly say, it was hilarious because they caught uh, one of the hunters in HQ talking about what to do when you are on the run. So you try and give the viewers advice what to do when they're in this situation, whether a fugitive, they've done something wrong, and they're on the run. And so it's like, you learn that this is what you do when you're on the run. This is how you actually get ri- get off the road. This is how you actually get undetected. I think that's very useful. I'm, I'm a big fan of American uh, crime procedural dramas. My entire life is spent watching Law and & Order and, and CSI. And I firmly believe that, that CSI over the last 20-something years, 23 years it's been running, has probably taught me and an awful lot of people how to murder, dismember, and dispose of a body very effectively and not get caught. Yeah. And, and they've also I've tried this out, but it's quite tempting. Yeah. And they've also taught you how to do that in every US state. That's right. And each one, how, how to get past each one's local laws. It's fantastic. Yeah, I do think that's the greatest thing about that franchise. It's like there's a CSI for 51 states and it's all been running for nearly 100 years. Uh, crack, crack in American TV. So there we have it. A wonderful interview and a wonderful 
uh, saga to start on this podcast. Will it return? Well, I can say that uh, the answer is probably. I can't say too much. Uh, my my uh, current guest will find out uh, uh, whether or not I can say something and know what it is after because I like teasing the viewers. Uh, but I like to keep the guests in the because then they're uh, intrigued. I love the word intrigued. But there we have it. Uh, that has been the Niche Podcast. The theme tune will be the theme tune, whatever the program is I'm talking about, if I don't get copyrighted. It all depends on whether or not the famous five theme tune will, will get me copyrighted. But find out. Hopefully, who can? I don't know who would care to copyright me about it. Well, look at it this way. If, you, if it is copyrighted and you get in trouble, I promise I'll come and visit you in prison. <laughs> and so there we have it thank you guys for watching and remember no I forgot <laughs>